Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Waynesboro Seventh-day Adventist Sabbath School. And our lesson this uh, quarter is about Isaiah. And the one for today is a crisis of identity. And before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity to come to your house and to study your word and to hear the message that you have for us this day. Bless each one and bless those that are watching and may we be ready for your coming in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Crisis of Identity. What do you think that uh, is about? In Isaiah there in the second verse, in the first chapter it says, Hear, O heaven, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath uh, spoken. I have nourished and brought up a children, and they have rebelled against me. Norm, does a cow know where his crib is and where he belongs? <laughs> well, then they know where they belong, don't they? They have a. Rebellious. Have you ever, or have you ever been around somebody trying to break a steer for show? No, I was never that real involved in. I lived on a farm, but I I didn't come become so involved in it. <laughs> They put me in the mind of the people nowadays. When God wants people to follow him, he reasons with them. But it's just like a steer you're trying to break. He wants his way. Yeah. He rebels against you. He tugs. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, they, uh, a cow is determined sometimes that they want their way. Exactly. And, uh, and you would say a crisis in identity. Why, uh, the Israelites, they were God's people, weren't they? Yes. They were God's chosen people. And uh, they went to the sanctuary every Sabbath. They offered their sacrifices. They worshiped on Sabbath. They uh, uh, were very, uh, what shall I say, religious in doing their religious duty right. and uh, yet God says uh, I'm tired of it I'm tired of, of having uh, all these these bloody animals to die and all that what do you think he meant when he said that Nor? I think he meant you're doing all this worship and all this praise but it's just a form of tradition. It's not coming from your heart where it should come from. It's not coming from the heart where it should come from. It's just become a uh, kind of a... Ritual. Routine. Just a ritual. Just something I do or something that they did. Yeah. Well, is there a message in that for us today? Oh, I think there is. There's a story that goes, uh, it happened in uh, Russia, that there was this, in the gardens of the uh, uh, castle there in, in Russia where the czars used to live, there was this patch of ground that nothing grew there, but there was always a soldier guarding it. And every, every day they would change the guards and stuff and and one day somebody decided to ask the question, what is he guarding? Well, they didn't know, so they went and asked those that were there before them, and they, well, I don't know, that's a great question. I don't, they went back and asked, and finally they got down to somebody who remembered. And basically what it was, was back in the days of the czars, the czar had planted a beautiful flower, a rose, just 
for his, his wife, for the prince, princess. And uh, basically, somebody had come and plucked a flower off of it, and the czar was highly incensed by that, so he posted a guard there to make sure that that flower was cared for and watched over. Well, one regime after another comes into play, and they're still got the guard there, but the, the flower eventually dies and disappears. But they're still militarily guarding that, that plot of ground where that flower, and nobody knew why. Well, sometimes I think in our experience, we have forgotten the reasons why we do things. And we need to go back and ask the ancients why we do the things that we do. And I think this is what God is saying, you know, come now, let us reason together. That says the Lord, though your sins be as scarlet, they may be as white as snow. Though they be red as crimson, they shall be as wool. God is asking us to come and reason, to come and talk about things. Let's work things out and understand one another because apparently we have we have uh, forgotten who we are or where we come from or where we're going. Well then, what was God saying when he said, uh, Hear, O heaven, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. What was, what was he called? Did he, did he mean that the earth and heaven can speak to us? Is that what he was saying? No, what, was it, what was God trying to tell us there? A lot of times in, in ancient uh, contracts and so forth, they would say, God, be a judge between us. And they would offer a sacrifice and ask God to, to be a witness. Well, the earth and the, the heavens and the seas were a witness to what was taking place there. And they were asking, you know, when, when, when this thing is forgotten, remember what was, what was agreed to here. And God had made a covenant with his people, didn't he? A long, long time ago. And they had forgotten. There was the things the covenant curses and the covenant promises. Well, who in the world could God call on that would be somebody greater than him that could uh, see to it that the covenant was honored and no one broke it? He couldn't. So what he's really saying is emphasizing the fact that he, God, is going to see everything that you do. And if you break that covenant with him, now, uh, when you were uh, baptized and whenever you first came to the foot of the cross, didn't you promise God that whatever he would have you do, you would do? We all did, didn't we? Do we still keep that covenant when God asks us to maybe shell out a few dollars for this or go do this for him? And sometimes, Richard, we, uh, we forgot to read the fine print, like in a contract. Amen. We agreed to something we signed on something and said, oh, that was well, included in that? And, and we forget. Isn't that what God's trying to tell through Isaiah to his people today that you need to be sincere about what you're saying. Yeah. He wants you to. Now, how in the world can a helpless human being uh, keep God's commandments or do what God wants him to do? How can he do that? Well, that's what it says. If he that walks in the spirit cannot, will not sin. No, if you walk in the spirit of Christ and Christ, as we look at his life and as we were singing hymns about going to the cross, coming to the cross and so on, did he sacrifice something to leave heaven? He definitely did. And the love that he had for this world was that it was a self-sacrificing love. And then also, Jesus himself was a self-denying love that drove him to the cross. And now, 
Don't we know that this mind that was in Christ is to live in us? Amen. So if the mind of Christ is to be in us, then wouldn't it be self-sacrificing love? Would it not be a self-denying love? And I think that's what God is asking here through the prophet Isaiah. Do you still have that first love that you had? Or have you forgotten it? And how can the world tell that you are a child of God? How can, how can the world tell? How can you tell whether, whether uh, I have, am a child of God or not? Do I just say I am, and that makes me a child of God? What you do, your actions. Actions. Yeah, the way you live. The way I live. Oh, my. I hate to have you look at me. <laughs> Because I don't always live the way I should live or haven't in the past. Well, then that brings us to that part of our uh, uh, rotten realiza realization or realization. Ritualism. Uh -huh. I can't. I, I Ritualism, can't. yeah. Yeah, I can't. It just don't come out right. In other words, is it real? Is our. Is our uh, our profession real. Isaiah is conveying the thought of God. God's asking us, are you real? You say, well, I feel like I'm real. You know, Richard, what's, what's interesting to me is God, through the prophet Isaiah, is calling to his people in the book of Amos, it says God never does anything unless he first informs us through his prophets in Isaiah chapter, I mean Amos, Amos chapter 8. That God always informs, he sends prophets to tell him what, what's about to happen and why he's doing it. So that it's, it's not without response, I mean without understanding. Uh, when you were little, you were told that if you ride in the street with your bicycle, you're going to get a spanking. Your parents told you something like that, did they not? Right. Or if you, if you're on a farm and you you're tormenting the the cows and stuff, you know, so you better stop that. You're going to get kicked. <laughs> and then yeah, and then and then it's like, well, how did they know that? God always warns us ahead of time. Now, why does he warn us? Because he loves us. He loves us. He doesn't want to see us be hurt or to be injured or to injure another person. You know, not, not you know, we didn't mean to, but sometimes by our actions, we, we do wound people. Yes, Rick. Uh, what was the crisis in that period of time in which Isaiah was called uh, to be a prophet? What was the impending crisis? Syria was a threat. Yeah. Uh, they had already overrun the northern kingdom and had destroyed them. Uh, he was calling people to sit up and take notice because your time has come. They were at your door, you know. And if you don't, if you don't repent and start living the way God wants you to live, you're going to be destroyed too, or you're going to be called hauled off into exile. And of course, they didn't listen. You know, this, this story, and Bob, I, I appreciate you for bringing that up because Isaiah's ministry was toward the end of the divided kingdoms of Israel, of the, where the, Israel and, and Judah were, were separated back in the time of Rehoboam and, and uh, Solomon. Solomon's time, yeah, when, the, when the, the kingdoms were divided. And so Isaiah, is, it comes on a scene now toward the end of this event. And you know that 
the northern tribes had drifted off into severe idolatry, and the southern tribes were dabbling in it, and they weren't quite to the degree, but they were making a lot of mistakes. Well, the Lord said that they were like Sodom and Gomorrah. Yeah. Yet they were uh, following all the rituals of the tabernacle, offering all the uh, offerings to be forgiven and all that, but they never had the change. The Reformation never took place. See, and that's what he was calling for. Do you think God wants a reformation for us today? Oh, I know so, and I think this is why he sent this book that we can learn from their mistakes and from their stiff neck, the, 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 un, the unnecessary pain and, and struggles that they went through because they didn't respond to God's plea. Yes, Pastor? There is a tendency that we all humans have, and that is that we at some point disconnect the ritual from the reality, yeah. the symbol from the experience. And we all, any one of us, either have fallen or are in a fallen state or perhaps we might fall into the same pitfall. And that pitfall is assuming that just keeping the ceremonialism or ritualism, we are spared of our own faults, our own shortcomings. And it happened with the, at the times of the, and it happened at the times of the ancient Israel. It happened at, again in the times of the uh, medieval church, the Protestant Reformation. There came a time that the Protestant Reformation thought that Christianity was all about who was right theologically, and they start debating uh, and in the process not living up to the message that the Lord intended. And also happened with second, third, or fourth generation of Seventh-day Adventists because they grew up in the message and they were accustomed to the Sabbath, to communion, to other ritualisms that we use in our church services feed washing and so on. And they saw our children become disconnected. I am including my own. To understand the symbology and the reality. But for those who are first time Adventists who came from the world and know how ugly the world is, as they come into the faith, then the symbol and the ritualism is connected to their own reality. And that is why that connection uh, allows them to be able to have a service to God that is more genuine, where the fruits are matching the ritual. And that's just my comment. Oh, even though we have grew up as Adventists, we don't necessarily have to drop away. We, don't we can uh, be faithful to God and we can have that uh, connection with God, and it can be a love connection, but then it's a little bit like you said, humans, we even begin to take our spouse's love for granted. For granted. Yeah. And that's what we have a tendency then to do, and it doesn't really matter whether we grew up or whether we came in as Adventists, we began to trust the church as the, or the denomination as to, if I belong to that denomination, I, I'm gonna be saved. Or if I uh, go do this or that, or pay my tithe, or, or, or uh, give to an offering, or take part in communion, I'm saved. No, it's not the, the uh, sacrifice that you may have made. It is the true love connection that you keep cultivating with God. 
that really makes the difference. Amen. Amen. Richard, I, I had an interesting experience. My mother gave me a picture, and it had four generations of, uh, of my mother's family. There was my great-grandmother and great-grandfather. There was my grandmother and uh, her husband. And then, then there was, my grandmother was pregnant with my mother in that picture. And how many of us can go back? I was looking at that picture. What is my great-grandfather's name? How many of us know the first name of our great-great-grandfather? Not many of us. Yeah, yeah. the genealogy. But most of us have forgotten. And I think if we go back to the time of Ellen White, that's four generations back. How many of us have forgotten the pedigree that we came from? The, the, the way things were back then, and things begin to be watered down, or we begin to slip from, from those, those times. And I think that the same thing is, is true in Isaiah's day. He is pointing people, listen, you have, God is, is reaching out to you. He says, you've forgotten from whence you came, what your, what your ancestor is, what, what relationship you have to me. And I, I want to bring you back into relationship. And so God is crying out to his people then, and he's crying out to us now in the book of Isaiah, for us to re-examine our relationship with God, re-examine the contract that we have with God, the covenant we have with God. One extra comment I would like to make is that Micah was not too, close, not too far from the same time of Isaiah, even though his book is after. Mm -hmm. If you look at the date when it was written, just right. about that uh, close time, and in chapter 6, verses 6 to 8, it says, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself, bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offering, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with the thousands of rams, ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O oh men, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Amen. It seemed that all of that ritualism could be just simplified in three things. Just do justly, do the right thing, and extend mercy to other people, and then don't brag about it. Yeah. Walk humbly before yeah. your God. Yeah. yeah. Do the thing, and then don't brag about it. Exactly. <laughs> okay, let's also look at uh, uh, Isaiah 1, verse 18. Come now, and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. That's forgiveness. That's what God wants to do for us. He wants to forgive us. Of, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So what we need to do is go to God and confess what it is that our conscience is telling us we are not doing right. We need to confess that too. To God. Now I can't tell you what you are doing right because all I got to do is look at myself and I can see lots of things that are not being done right. See, so that's what God's asking us to do. Come now, let us reason together. And then what he does after he forgives us, he looks at us as if we had never sinned. And then he sends, says to us, go and sin no more. See, so that's what he wants us to do. He wants us because all of the sacrifice that we may do is done because we love God.
for what he has done for us. Yeah. If you realize of how much God has forgiven you for the sins you have uh, done, and the more that is forgiven, the more you love the person who is going to treat you right. And so, if you have more love, that means you may want to do more for him. See? So that's what God is looking for. He's looking for that. He's not looking for you and I to say, well, now, in order for me to get more blessings, in which we're going to talk about, to here to eat or be eaten. And if we well, think that to get more blessings, we need to pay our tithe, and then he's going to bless me tremendously. Well, hey, is there anything we can do to gain the favor of God? I didn't hear it real loud. No. No, we can't. Nothing. It's all on God's part Amen. and his merits. Amen. That gives us it's Christ's merits that gives us the... Uh, earns us the favor. It's the same thing when it comes to going into the uh, new earth and, and entering into the pearly gates to partake of the tree of life. Hey, our keeping of the, of the commandments is not earned, did not earn our right to go in there. Christ, who lived in me, earned the right to go in there. And he just gives me the credit. Now, who in the world is going to do something so great for people and then let them have the credit as having done it. <laughs> Not us humans. We ain't going to do that. No. We have to be, like Peter says, be a partaker of the divine nature. This, this was uh, in, in uh, Nebuchadnezzar's day. That was one of the sins. Look at this great city that I have made. And God showed him the, 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 the vision of the tree. You know, it's like, who made you a great nation? Who, who put all this in your hands? It was God himself that did. Yes. And when I became, when I, when I wanted to be a fireman, I was a little kid, probably five or six years old. And I remember I was at one of these little uh, things, those little kid parties or whatever. And a lady asked me, she says, what do you want to be? And I said, I want to be a, either a jet pilot or, or a fireman. And I ended up being a fireman. Now, I consider myself to be a fair to midland fireman, but how would I have ever gotten there if it hadn't been for somebody who showed me how to be a fireman? Hadn't given me the skills and taught me, spent hours and hours and hours in patience with me, teaching me these things, and allowing me to make mistakes and, and helping me to, to, to find my way to do it better and to do it more perfectly that God has been doing that with his people. That he, you know, we can't do anything without those that have gone before us. And, and certainly God is the one that ultimately is at the end of that line that, that provides everything, all the skills and talents and, and abilities that we have. Pastor? On that term, the Hebrew term there for reason, pedos reason together, actually is a technical term that is used in court when there is a litigation and there is an argumentation going back and forth. That's the, the linguistic aspect of that particular passage, which enables us to understand the mentality of the Jewish mentality, especially the prophets. The prophets, they argue with God. Like Habakkuk, Habakkuk said, I understand that our people are sinful and that we deserve punishment. But why are you punishing us with the Chaldeans who are worse than us? Mm -hmm. uh, and so God answered back and he said, well, I'm going to punish them too as well as I am using them to punish you. But in the process of going back and forth, I think that uh, with time we lost that uh, closeness to God to uh, bring him to, to to bring him to an understanding that we see that makes sense. Because many times what God asks doesn't make sense. No. 
like grabbing a serpent by the tail. God said that to <coughs> Moses, grab the serpent by the tail. But prior to ask that, he showed proof of a burning bush, a mm -hmm. bush that was burning and not consuming itself into ashes, and also the hand that became le leper hand yes. and then went back and then was restored. So God understands where we are and when he is asking us and he's challenging us, he's not challenging us blindfolded. <coughs> he gives us some elements of evidence. Yes. No wonder why the Bible tells us that uh, we need to come to God, which is our reasonable service. Romans 12.1. And there the word reasonable, it just means logical. Makes sense. In this logic, if, we, if our mind is sanctified, if so, our mind is not sanctified, it will not make sense. But if we are in tune with him, we will see that what he's asking us just makes sense. And is reasonable. And is reasonable. Yes. How about on Wednesday's part? Okay. Go ahead. Okay. okay. How about on Wednesday's part? To eat or be eaten? <laughs> what is the, What is uh that lesson talking about. To eat or be eaten. Isaiah 1, verses 19 and 20. Yeah, I've seen a hand back oh, here. What I wrote down for that, to eat, I figure how I describe it is pretty much God's given us all the tools that we need, all the, the love in the Bible, all the ways to succeed to heaven if we choose not to eat of that good fruit um, we're surely going to die um, mm -hmm. so he's giving us the opportunity to say hey eat of this fruit or you're going to die yeah take advantage of what God has given or to us die. or the other thing is to die well it's also a blessing and a curse that he's yes. talking about you'll be blessed if you are obedient to God. Now, why would it be that he would bless us if we are obedient and not bless us if we weren't obedient? What is God's reasoning there? It just makes sense. Yeah, it makes sense. But there's also another statement in the word of God back in the Gospels where Jesus says that his blessings fall on the just and the now make those two match. The uh, blessings follow the just and, and the unjust. Rain falls on the wicked as well as, as the righteous. Okay. They, they let's are, let's they, hear some of what you have to say. There are certain blessings in, uh, along the line of what Peggy is sharing with us, the covenant that God made with creation after the flood. It was a covenant where God is saying, I will never destroy mankind again with the water. And everyone, and, and, everyone and that, benefited from that. And everybody, animals, and the entire creation benefit from it. There are certain blessings that comes out of God's exuberant, abounding grace. Good for everyone. However, there are certain blessings that are uh, in, in, in framed in the context of conditional promises and conditional blessings that are uh, only given as the person is meeting the condition by which those promises can come. Like, for instance, when we read in the New Testament that if we pray according to his will, right. then he will respond and give those blessings. And now let me move the veil and let's go into the invisible world. Paul says that we are a theater to the universe. Mm -hmm. There are intelligent beings beyond and angels that are looking at what is happening here. And God owes an explanation to them. Not because, he, uh, not because he, he has to, but we worship a God that he discloses himself. Transparent God, nothing to hide. And he then goes on to, to, to see that if, if he would be blessing someone, that is defiantly going against his will, then uh, just like Satan appears uh, representing earth 
and said, hey, there is a guy on earth, his name is Job. Why you, you are blessing me only because he, he, he has some, uh, he knows that he has some advantages. You have protected him. So there are certain elements that God's blessing, uh, if he will bestow it upon the wicked, then the, the, the devil can say, oh, that, that's a foul. Or you are not keeping the rules or something of that nature. If there is an element of complexity and that is beyond our way to, to see it and to reason, we can best accept it as it is, but definitely our part is to see that we are living up to the light that the Lord has given us in his great mercy. You know, the Bible says that while we were still enemies, Christ died for us. I mean, think about that word enemies. I mean, is there any more vile word if somebody is your enemy? And Don't yet he died for me. He gave me an unthinkable gift. Donna, back there, has something to say. Donna, Donna. Okay, Donna. I was uh, thinking of something uh, much, much, much older than that. Back in the time of Abraham, when the Lord is revealing to Abraham his, his uh, plan to take care of Sodom and Gomorrah to destroy it, and Abraham said, "Well, if you find this, if you find twenty righteous, fifty righteous people, then how about yep. you just find one?" And he said, "For the sake of that one, I won't destroy it." Um, if it's all about, and it's all, and, and just like Pastor talked about the. the uh, creation witnesses. It's all about God restoring us to him and he doesn't delight in the death of the wicked. He wants us all to be reunited with him. Whatever Amen. will whatever will display his character and his love and prove his love, that's what he's going to do. And if it takes blessing somebody who's sinning, then that's what it's going to take. Whatever will reveal his character reveal his character and draw them to him. Thank you. God knows that some of us, we can only learn in the school of hard knocks. Yes. <laughs> Which I'm a chief student. <laughs> it's funny, she went on that story we were actually talking about yesterday. Um, in that story, Abraham, Abraham, he's pleading that there's one, at least one good person there, but God knew that Lot would have the sin that would fall over Lot's family yeah. further down the line. So I almost feel like Abraham went against God there, pleading for people that he believed was righteous, but God knew that his children's children would have issues down the line and be called yeah. a whole bunch of sin. Yeah. And so I think almost God was kind of like, okay, you want to do it your way? Okay, we'll let you see it your way, and you'll see what your way caused versus destroying the whole city and eliminating all lot, his daughters, all that stuff, all that lineage yeah. of sin that now carries on today through lineage and stuff like that. So I think God has allowed that to occur so you can see, okay, if I, I let God, God allowed me to do it my way. Let me see what came from that versus if you were to just eliminate that, all the sin would not be. There. We can see how toxic sin is and we should flee from it. I mean, how many of us would play in a sandbox full of vipers? You know, nobody in their right mind, but there are idiots that do that. I've seen them in Texas and places like that. They have these snake rodeos and stuff and these, these people, they go and there's no good sense on doing something like that. And yet we, we think that we can play in a sandbox full of vipers and not get bitten eventually. You know, the wages of sin is death, and the, and the Bible is very clear. And, and God says you can learn the easy way by taking my word, or you can find out the hard way. And uh, this, this is the mercy of uh, the, the, the love of God. Yes, brother. Is when you look at the lesson, you're talking about forgetting who, who your identity is. You talk about not playing in snakes, a pit full of snakes and vipers, but I would submit to you that we do and we have. And we do and we have and we dabble in what is contrary to God's word. Right. And when we look at things that violate that law, it's still an act of worship. Cain worshiped God as well, but he did it his own way, right. and it's wrong. Yeah. When we're when we're, when, we're, when we're partaking of something that is against the word of God, in any way, we're, we're, you know, it's like, you know, if, if I'm going to watch a, if, I, if I'm going to go to church, with some, if I'm going to go to a Sunday keeping church, I'm going to sit in their pew and I'm going to listen to what the guy's speaking from up front. I'm partaking in what they're doing and what he's saying, and that is forgetting who you are. That's the identity you're forgetting. That's dabbling in the snake pit. Yeah. 
And we do it all the time. Yes, and we do. Wrong. Amen. God's waiting there's, for us to figure it out. There's no middle. There's no middle ground. No, no middle ground at all. No, no. It doesn't get there's no way. compromise. No. Now, why, why do you think that is? Mm -hmm. Norm? If God did not want us to follow his will, he wouldn't have made these laws and invited us to follow them to begin with. Now, if you've ever put something together, or even tried to cook something, that you, what happens when you don't do exactly as those steps tell you to put it together and do it? What happens? Well, I end up with something that tastes different, and also <laughs> I may not like it at all. <laughs> See? So uh, that's what usually happens. You know, but here, here we look at the middle ground. Why isn't there a middle ground? Well, if we were to say we want to be like Christ and we are only 50% like him, why isn't that good enough? And the reason for that is because you are not really a follower of Christ unless you follow him all the way. Amen. And by following him all the way is what it takes to be like Christ. And that's what he tells us. Deny thyself, take up thy cross, and follow me. Peggy? you are hot or cold but because you are lukewarm I will spew you or vomit you out of my mouth so why do you there is no middle ground with God it's either hot or cold you can't be warm lukewarm because what he's going to do to us is just vomit us up spew yeah. us out of his mouth yeah. and that's a horrible thought brother Ann um, as you're saying with the lukewarm I think today's time we don't um, we don't want to offend anybody. We live in a society now where I don't want to hurt your feelings. I don't know where you came from, so I don't want to call you out on your sin and say that's wrong. So I, I try to play it down. So hopefully you get the message, but I don't want to say, call you out on that because I don't want to offend you. I don't want to push you away. I want to keep you close enough where you kind of get part of the word. And I call it the 80 20 is what I'm reading in the book. Yeah. So I give you 80% of God's word, but I don't give you the extra 20 because I don't want to push you away too far. And I believe that was your brother. Okay, I was saying that we, it's wrong. Um, we have to call each other out. We have to say, no, this is wrong. This is, this is the only way you can do it. If you're not doing it this way, you are doing it wrong. Yeah. It doesn't mean you're not going to make mistakes, but as long as you get up, brush yourself off, and continue down that path of righteousness, we can all be saved, but we cannot just dwell in the lukewarm water and say, we're good here. Oh, it seems comfortable. <laughs> uh, actually, I prefer the hot water in the hot tub. It's the lukewarm water in the bathtub. <laughs> Especially with lower back pain. <laughs> <laughs> lower back pain, huh? With lower back pain, hot seat bath are very good. Yeah. Richard, let, let's touch on uh, Thursday just a little bit, real quick. Okay. We're, we're out of time here. We only got a minute or two. Yeah. Isaiah 5, it talks about, uh, it says, Now I will sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard and is a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it and he gathered it out of the, gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and made a wine press therein and looked on it should uh, bring forth grapes and it brought forth wild grapes. Now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem, the men of Judah, judge, I pray you, between me and my vineyard, what could have been done more in my vineyard that I have not done in it? 
And if we uh, look at the sacrifice that Jesus made at Calvary, what more could he have done for us to make a way for us? And he is doing presently, interceding for us in the heavenly sanctuary. What more could he have done for us? I mean, when Jesus comes and, and judgment closes, what defense will we have? What, what excuse can we offer? None. He is our judge, our jury, and our executor. Every knee shall bow and, and every lip shall confess that Christ is God. Not only that, look what he has done to plead with me that I should, through my conscience, that I should follow him. Yeah. See, he does that with every one of us. Yeah. Now, I can have the choice of saying, no, I don't want to. And I don't want to follow what you're trying to talk to me about. But Satan uses the same five senses to get to our conscience yeah. the same way. Yeah. But still, we have to make that decision. Yeah. And that's what he wants us to do. He don't want us to be say we're for him, and we're not. And we do uh, all other kinds of things. That makes us lukewarm. But to say we are his child, and act like we are his child, that's being hot towards God. Amen. So, would you have prayer sure. for us? Father in heaven, as we uh, continue to, to study uh, the words of the prophet uh, Isaiah that you have put in his mouth, Lord, for us in these days, Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts and that our hearts would be res uh, responsive, Lord, to the pleading of your prophets of your spirit, Lord, that call to each one of us. Help us, Lord, to turn away from sin once and for all. Help us to, to cling to you, Lord, our only hope. Bless us now, Lord, as we go into the, to the worship service. May you bless your servant who uh, will bring us uh, your word uh, this morning in the, the, the high worship service, Lord. May we be touched. And may we be uh, responsive, Lord, uh, to your word. Help us, each one, that we would find our way, that we would one day spend eternity with you. Bless us now, we pray in the most holy name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs>